the topic today is something quite interesting, actually, and uh, one of the most fun and influential work that came out. It, it, it comes under the topic, uh, uh, or what it is called, uh, the, uh, the name itself is quite interesting. It is called, um, well, this is not a good color. Let me pick generative adversarial networks. GAN, they are called GAN. Now, I will go over the word quite interestingly. What you do is network. So here, by network, you mean deep neural networks. So what you have is a two networks. One is called, let me just call it D. Think of it as a detective or a police. The, the more formal term is discriminative. Discriminator. Discriminator. Think of it as a cop. And then there is another network, which is called the generator. Generator. Uh, let, let, let's just see that the counterfeit maker. Counterfeit maker. So what happens is this is the adversarial nature comes from the fact that they both try to fool, uh, like the generator tries to fool, the counterfeit maker tries to fool the cop and the cop tries to catch the counterfeit. And I'll explain what I mean. And then there is this word, provocative word, generative. Generative uh, ultimately refers to the generator. What happens is that when the cops and counterfeiter, they become very good, right? They learn and they become pretty good as networks. Then you can throw away technically the cop and the generator can go about generating a lot of counterfeits that look real. So uh, what do I mean by that? Let's take an example. Suppose you have uh, lots of examples of, uh, uh, we'll take something, let's say a dollar bill, dollar bills because we are using the word counterfeits. So lots of dollar bills and coins or whatever, but these are examples of it, real examples, which we will write as an X vector. It is conventional to write it as an X, as the real data, right, obviously. Then what happens is the job of the discriminator is to tell, given an input, given an input, it has to tell, is it real? means did it come is it a real dollar bill or is it a fake dollar bill or fake coin whatever you want to say coin or dollar bill right it just has to give an answer let's say that the y is equal to one is real and y is equal to zero label is fake right you can choose this is a conventional way that you uh, put it like that so you could you would say that well uh, this is a pretty real life situation and uh, as far as discriminant is concerned, what is it doing? Given an input, it's classifying as real or fake. You would call this algorithm, or what, what would you call this algorithm? What is this network doing? Would you say that this is just a class classification? Classification. Yeah, right? It's just classify, classifying between real and fake. Right? Given an input, it is predicting that this is real, that this is fake. So this is a very interesting. It will produce a y hat of its own, right? So if you give it to x, suppose the input is uh, whatever the input is, uh, it will just do d of input, and that will be a y hat, right? And uh, for real data, for real notes, for real bills, dollar bills. Yes. Now, what about the generator? Generator is just sitting there. The generator has never seen what a US currency looks like. This is the most interesting thing. Typically, when you try to fake something, you have a pretty good idea what it is, isn't it? You have seen it. 
uh, the way people counterfeit bills is dollar bills, for example, is they would very carefully see all the hidden security markers there in a bill and try to, try to counterfeit that. Right? And as you know, that itself is a, uh, and so there's a real life counterpart to it. As you probably know, the old dollar bills, they didn't have US currencies. They didn't have that many security measures. Right? The technology was not so advanced. If you take a dollar bill from 50 years ago, it would be very, very different from the dollar bill of today. And those dollar bills of the past are presumably much easier to counterfeit. So, well, they get successfully counterfeited. Now, counterfeit is of degrees. Uh, the trouble is you don't have to be a perfect counterfeit. Most of the time, if it is a close enough replica, you can use it as currencies, especially abroad, right? Where you know, uh, it's sort of all sorts of all variations of dollar bill. I, I don't know if you know, most of the hundred dollar bills of the United States don't exist in US. They are mostly used outside. In fact, the world, the world standard in currency, right? Especially in the criminal world is the hundred dollar bill. The US hundred dollar bill is the gold standard. So, uh, so I've been told, I'm told that when, uh, I don't know, let's think of some criminals, whatever, drug dealers or something, when they do business deals, bags of $100 bills change hands or something like that abroad, right? So, well, anyway, uh, we'll leave that. Uh, now, what happens with the dollar bills itself is, uh, over the years, the US government has been trying to, um, foil the counterfeiters. Every time the counterfeiters begin to make something that looks uncannily like the real dollar bill and only an expert can tell the difference, they add more security features to the, to the dollar bill. And I believe every country must be doing some similar things. I, I once looked at the British pound, the British currency carefully, and it seemed to also have all sorts of security features embedded. In it. So every country tries to make uh, it hard to counterfeit. So what happens is the the data gets more and more complicated, isn't it? You, you make it harder and harder to counterfeit it. And the counterfeiters use all the technology available to them to um, somehow uh, create a reasonable enough facsimile of the original thing that it can pass for, pass for the real. It can sort of simulate the real and people can get duped by it. So this is the real world situation. The same situation, we will, we will bring in here. And, uh, and the idea of this idea was created in a, a paper, a landmark paper of 2014. Right? Literally the title of the paper is Generative Adversarial Network, Liu Kern and some big luminaries are on the paper. And it turns out that one of the co-authors of the paper uh, is my cousin in the extended family. So um, that was 2014, and it was hailed as uh, one of the landmark breakthroughs in deep uh, in in artificial intelligence and deep neural network. Many people went so far as to uh, say that this is perhaps the first truly intelligent uh, neural network. Well, I think it was a bit of a hyperbole. It is one neural architecture. We will look at it today, but but it's a uh, it's a architecture that had profound results. It led to many good things and many bad things. Right? It, the whole world of deep fakes comes from this generative adversarial network. So when the generator becomes very good at faking or making counterfeits, it can counterfeit anything, not just dollar bills, not just uh, any text or something like that. It can counterfeit and generate uh, human faces that don't exist. It can generate photographs of non-existent human beings that are so real, you would not know that this is not a real human being. It is able to create videos of uh, people uh, saying whatever you want them to say. For example, uh, I think I began this workshop with uh, this entire series with a video of an MIT course on artificial intelligence in which the lecture started with Obama introducing the course, right? Obviously Obama did not introduce the course. What was happening is one human being was speaking and that input was 
that input was going into the generator. Generator, when fully trained, what it was doing is it was producing a video of Obama in full Obama accent saying things that he obviously never said. Do you guys remember that video? <coughs> yeah, anyone in the audience, do you guys remember? If not, Kyle, could you please post that video back into the Slack channel right now from our course web page? It is there on the course page portal. Okay. Yeah, please do that. Huh? So uh, I would say in the break, please do watch the video to be instructive. Now, the state of the art has moved forward to such an extent that you don't <coughs> even need a lot of raw material. You don't need a lot of videos of a person, the voice, the thing, mannerisms. Shorter and shorter amount of information is uh, can be used to fake you. So we can generate a video doing you doing all sorts of uh, silly things, for example, uh, I don't know, um, riding a donkey, for example, which you may never have done and you would swear you don't want to do, or uh, just about anything you want, uh, anything somebody else wants. And it is getting harder and harder to tell it apart from real, real things. So there used to be a saying that believe, nothing that you hear and half of what you see. And that thing now has new meaning. Quite literally, even when you see things, you see photographs, you see videos, you don't know whether it's genuine or not, it is fake. So that is the ethical aspect of generative adversarial networks. Once you create a generator that can counterfeit things, that can fake things, it's a very dangerous tool. But it can also be a tool for great value. In fact, GANs have tremendous positive potentials. Uh, one of the things that people love to do it is um, uh, neural style transfer applies GANs and so forth. We use that. Uh, there's a little bit more to it than the classic GAN, but um, uh, we will do that in the computer vision course in great detail. It's absolutely lovely. You can take any one thing, any one person like Van Gogh, with the Van Gogh style of art, you can take uh, Monet, you can take Picasso, you can take whatever your artist is, favorite artist is or style is. And what you could do is you can keep it one side and then you can ask, you can take a photograph of that you have taken and or Ansel Adam, whatever. You can take a, well, Ansel Adam is a very contrasty photographic style, but yes. Uh, then you can take any photograph that you have taken and you say what, um, I, wish, uh, I wish Van Gogh had painted this or uh, Monet had painted this. And lo and behold, you can, just apply that style so that all of a sudden your fo your photograph is rendered into near perfect Monet or Van Gogh or Picasso style or any style that you like of the artist. So that brings up very interesting questions. What is art now? Right? Uh, like for example, if I create a, a painting using Gans, of a scenery, of a scene, which is looks indistinguishably like authentic in Monet style. Does it, should it be sold for 10, $1 million or $10 million, right? It has become too easy to produce it. And so what is art itself? It's a very interesting question. In a time when deep neural network produces art that is very, very hard for human beings to produce on, with their paintbrushes and so forth. And it does it not in months, but in a couple of, well, minute, two minute, five minutes and so forth. So <clears throat> this topic of generative adversarial networks is a very important topic. I'm going to go over this slowly. Now I must mention that GANs, I will explain the original GAN because that is the foundation of this thing. Once you get the foundation, remember that the classic GAN that I uh, will explain today, and I'll try to explain one more, the, one of the more modern GANs, the Wasserstein GANs, but GANs has become a cottage industry. There is a tremendous amount of research into GANs, right? People are trying to, uh, like there's not only an initiative to generate, for example, deep fake. How do you use GANs to contract that and find whether something is a fake or not? Right and so for detect deep fakes, etc. And the GAN, the various GAN architectures and different uh, aspects of GAN by using different loss functions and so forth. So it's a very rich literature. 
In fact, uh, Manning, uh, the same publishers who, who have published the textbook that we're using, they actually have an entire book called Gans in Action. Gan in Action. And uh, I encourage you to read it. It's not a very fat book. It's a very good book. You can read it. Their, <coughs> their entire website is devoted to GANs, to all the GAN architectures. Variational GANs, uh, there's many, many, many uh, GAN, uh, sorry, not variation, there are many, many GANs, convolutional, Wasserstein, and so on and so forth. The, the, the richness is quite, quite impressive. And GANs, we are doing it as an extension of like are sort of beyond autoencoders for a reason. I started with autoencoders and then I'm going to Gantt. You will see there is a reason why it is so. See, autoencoders too, the variational kind uh, or the kind that I sort of alluded to, I said that in autoencoders, you come up with a condensed representation. Remember that, let me sort of relate it to it. In an autoencoder architecture, You have this, X goes in and X tilde comes out, right? Y, basically Y, you produce Y hat, which is approximately like X, like you want it to be approximately like X, the output. Do we agree guys? Right? Now, we, we have a latent representation This was the latent representation. Now, in the, in the classic autoencoder, we allowed Z to be discovered automatically, whatever, it was no constraint. But there is a form of uh, autoencoder, which uh, for brevity, of, for time constraints, we didn't go into, but I will go into in one of the Sunday sessions. These are called variational. autoencoder. In the variational autoencoder, what you do is you put a constraint. You say that this Z, very roughly speaking, it must be, uh, it must take a specialized form. Let's say that it must take the form of a bell curve. The Z, Z must sample from a normal distribution of some kind. So let me introduce some uh, conventions so that we know. So uh, folks, have I introduced you? I mean, for those of you who have taken the original courses, you remember when I write a scripted N, it's either uh, one, uh, what in the world is this? In our notation, what does it mean, this fancy N, calligraphic N, zero one? Do you remember? Normal distribution. Yes, this is the uh, normal distribution. Now, what in the world is a normal distribution versus abnormal distribution? Okay. I once saw a joke. Uh, somebody said, this is a normal distribution. And then this <laughs> is a abnormal distribution. <laughs> or a paranormal distribution at most, right? So a normal distribution is just a bell curve. Bell curve generalized to, generalized to higher dimensions, dimensions, or simply put a bell hill of some form in let's say in two dimensions. It's a bell hill of some form, right? Somewhere centered, some center here, which is called mu, the location of the center, and how spread out the bell is, is the sigma square. Is the sigma, people write it as sigma, or traditionally a sigma square variation. So this, this is written as n, n for normal, mu, sigma square, right? Uh, this says, sigma being the standard deviation, this being the center of the, the bell. L. Are we together, guys? Right? And in higher dimension, in, uh, what happens is that this mu and, and this sigma, it is actually not, um, it's a matrix. If this is a vector, if mu in one dimension, mu 
and sigma are scalars, numbers. In higher dimension, mu is a vector. Why is it a vector? Think two dimensions. In two dimensions, this location will have a mu one and mu two component, isn't it? If this is the first axis, let's say x1 axis and this is the x2 axis, would you agree that mu, mu the center, will have a x1, x2 location? Are we together, guys? Is this simple? So imagine a hill sitting in this room. You would like to know what its location is. You need two in a x, y, on the floor, where is the center? So wherever the center is on the floor, the floor location needs two coordinates, right? If you think in terms of uh, uh, the north-south point and the east-west point, you need to know its location. So it will be two dimension. Now, sigma is the variance. So it becomes something called the sigma matrix, which will be the variance along first axis, right? Uh, sigma square, variance along first axis, variance along second axis, then uh, sigma one, two, sigma one, two square. Right. So that's what the sigma stands for, sigma matrix stands for. Right. Am I getting it right? Actually, these twos are unnecessary. Sigma is this, so then we can always put the squares there. So uh, this is called the covariance matrix. So generalization of standard uh, of variance is covariance. Covariance matrix. Covariance matrix. Right? So anyway, uh, it is a little harder if the math is elusive. Remember that in one dimensional, a bell curve is this. It, its center is mu, its variance is sigma. Right? How spread out it is is sigma. So go with that. So this is it. So when you say, zero, one. What do we mean? We mean a normal curve with <coughs> center at zero origin and with unit one variance. Would you agree? Uh, guys, I need some feedback because the whole class is remote. So if all of you stay on mute and don't give me any feedback, I would never know whether you're understanding or not. Understand. Yeah, just simple, right? So this is it. So now let's generalize it to higher dimension. In higher dimension, in higher dimension, suppose I take sigma to be just the unit matrix. It is called the identity matrix, which is basically one, one, zero, zero. Right? So let's say that's two dimensions, say two dimension, this. So this zero and identity matrix means <coughs> center is at zero, zero, and sigma, the the covariance part is at is the identity matrix, namely one one. In other words, it it is nice round bell curve centered in the uh, sitting at the center, bell hill rather. So imagine a nice. You have just poured sand at the origin. What what is the shape it will take? Roughly speaking, well, it won't exactly take the shape of a bell curve, but to the first approximation, as a, for the sake of intuition, it will take a shape that is symmetric around the origin right on the page, and that's it. That is your, this is what this is. Right? Yeah. That is the meaning of this. I was just interpreting what this means, right? So uh, just for brevity, when I continue this discussion, I won't be writing it in vector notation. I'll just write it as one, but assume that for generalization or for higher dimension, this is what I mean. Because I tend to get sloppy when I'm thinking through and uh, mix up my notations. So. <clears throat> now, one of the things that you have uh, is that if you force the Z to respect a bell curve, a, a normal distribution, especially with respect to specific classes, let's say that digits and so forth. So you say that uh, 
whichever way it comes here, the value Z, Z, its distribution is, let's say, normal for a given class. Normal, right? It's normal distribution. Then what happens? The autoencoder will learn it, but then what you can do? You can keep uh, you can keep only the decoder part of the autoencoder. See, the encoder part can be used for data compression, but the decoder part of a variational autoencoder becomes a generative model. Because what I can do is I can take any z from normal 0, 1, and when I feed it here and I sort of decode it, it will become something. It will become, let's say, uh, if you're talking digits, it will become the digit three. All right. And I sample from a nearby point, it will look like a different three, right? I sample from this point and it will look like eight, right? And so what has happened is we have created a generative model. Why? Because you can keep sampling. You can keep shooting to the decoder, any point sample from the normal distribution and it will produce a digit for you, right? If you have trained it, uh, trained it to, if you have trained the autoencoder on digits, right, what the X vector, right, uh, belong to, you know, the digits for zero all the way to nine, then, and that is what you try to recover here. You know that the dec decoder will produce a digit, image of a digit. And so irrespective of what input you give, it will start producing lots of digits. And so it, it has just become a producer of digits and very, very, interesting because uh, it will produce those digits in all sorts of styles and handwri handwriting styles and so forth, right? Quite amazing. That is the value of a generative model. A generative model can generate, once you train it, it can keep on generating new data, right? So generative models, uh, let me write it down, generative models, practically can be used to generate new data, data that near perfectly, near perfectly, perfectly mimics the original data. data and produces variants of it, produces variants of it. Now, we can say this in a more mathematical term. We can say that a generative model learns the, well, okay, I'll just say a statement, but uh, if it doesn't mean, if you are not very uh, trained in probability theory, um, I will make one distinction between generative models and discriminative models. See, when you create a discriminative, so in machine learning, you distinguish between generative and discriminative models. Everything that you learn, classifier, regressors, these are discriminative models effectively. Think of a classifier. You are saying that what is the problem? So suppose you're given an input vector X and this box classifier, is producing a Y hat, and you're basically determining which of the classes it belongs to, C1, C2, CK, the K classes, right? So what you're doing is given, so can I, uh, is this right? Is this what a classifier does, guys? Given an input, it tries to determine whether it's a cat, a dog, a horse, a zebra, and so forth. Right? That's what it does. So uh, the more formal way, you can say that, what is the probability of a class, let's say C, I, given the, vec given the input this, and you will find, you, you want to find that class which maximizes this probability. You know, that was the softmax thing. Which class has the highest probability of being true given that the input data is this. That is what a classifier is at heart, isn't it? Because it's never sure. It may say, I am, you know, 85% sure that it's a cow, right? 
I am, well, about 10% sure that it could be duck. And maybe I'm 5% sure that it is a horse. Let's take an example, something like that. Right? So 0 0.85, 0 0.1, 0 0.05. Those are your probabilities. Probability of a class, CI, given this input data, given this in the input data that we received. That's what it is. Do you see how this is the same thing, just written, written in a more succinct way, mathematical way. The trouble with succinct mathematical ways is, well, once you know it, it looks obvious. But if you don't know it, it looks rather scary. Right? Now, what is this? But actually, there's nothing scary. It's just a notation. Right? This is what you call the... So in other words, a discriminative model, discriminative models, models discover or model condition probabilities. Condition probabilities in the sense that what is the probability, i.e. Chance, chance that it is a cow, for example, given the input x, right? A photo, say a photo of x, a photo. Does that make sense? On the other hand, so do you say that, well, yeah, now what's the big deal? But what is a generative model? What a generative model does is it says, you know what? Suppose I could find the pro joint probability joint probability of X, the input, and a given output, C. Let's say uh, Y. Uh, let, me, let me put it as Y, because that's what people write it as. Y, for example, for classifier, Y would belong to? For classifier, it is basically probability X and CI, right? So you find out all of the probabilities Y, Y, so Y belongs to C1, C, K, any one of these values. So suppose you could find the joint probabilities. But now you say, now what in the world does that mean? Let's make it somewhat real. Suppose you had a probability curve and you knew that, let me mark it with two different colors. That, uh, so suppose, suppose the only, let's take one dimension. And this dimension is the weight or the size of the enemy, right? You would agree that for ducks, their weights This would be the probability distribution of input X and duck. And let's take cows. This would be somewhere here, far, far away, much bigger ones. So uh, I will deliberately sort of break the line here because uh, they are very <laughs> incomparably big. Cows are incomparably bigger than ducks. So uh, this uh, would be, would you agree that this would be the probability distribution of a cow's weight, right? Uh, this would be, uh, where are we? This would be somewhere in the range of ducks go from what? Well, newborn ducks, let's say are one pound. I don't know how big. I have, I have one question. Yes. The, the size of the uh, cows are bigger, but why the distribution we are assuming will be bigger? Because oh, because they so cows can be. See, think about it this way: uh, ducks, the range of weight is one to fifteen pounds. Let's say I don't know, maybe twenty pounds. How? What are the biggest, fattest ducks? Fifteen pounds? Is that reasonable? Thirty. Thirty pound ducks? Uh, you know how they feed them so very. Oh my goodness! Yeah, those genetically <laughs> modified. Uh, yeah. Harmonially fed ducks, I am told, are 30 pounds. Right? So, one to 30 pounds. On the other hand, when you look at a cow, typical weight of a cow is what? Maybe a newborn cow is, uh, 
They said 200 pounds. Is that reasonable? 200 pounds. Maybe closer to 30, 20, 30 pounds, I think. Only 20, 30 pounds the size? The newborn. Newborn. A calf is never 20, 30 pounds. Is it only? No. It's bigger than that. Well, okay. Let's, let's make it at least as big as a, as a big, big dog. Right? My dog is 80 pounds. So should we start? Maybe 70 pounds. Oh, whatever. 50 pounds. Whatever you take it. What is the other end of the cow's weight? Between 65 and 90 pounds per cow. Oh, for, yeah. 65 to 90. Okay, let's take a middle number, 80 pounds. So let's say a calf is about 80 pounds. And then uh, what does it grow up to? A typical cow's weight is? Range? Like a thousand. Thousand pounds? I don't know. Kate, could you please look it up? The oxes must be heavy. Still, uh, the should integrate to one, right? Yeah, it yeah. might be flatter. No, no. I, Coming to that, could you, Kyle? Hold on. So, what's the weight that you come up with? A female adult cow is average weight of sixteen hundred pounds. The males are twenty four hundred pounds. Twenty four. So let's say that on the other end, let's say some really heavy weights are about three thousand pounds. Right. So uh, you ask this question, why is this? So do you notice that the spread, the, the, the basically variation is much higher of the cow's weight. Does that answer your question? Who asked? Manish, you asked that question. Uh, Abhilash. Abhilash. So you get a sense, right? Why it needs to be broader, this much broader. But the consequence of its being much broader is that you uh, actually hang on. Let me see, the, the, there's another consequence of it. See, these distributions, what they are done is, so if these are frequency distributions, you normalize it. So you, you have to follow the constraint that the integral of P x duck B x has to be one. Means the area under the curve, this area is one. That, that is the definition of a distribution probability distribution, right? When you normalize it by the total area, it, is, it becomes a probability distribution. So the same thing, what will happen here is, uh, this will be actually much more peaked. It will be narrow and peaked, and this will be broad and spread out, right? Why? Because the same constraint has to apply. The area under the curve of Px cow, right? has to be equal to one. Abhilash, does that make sense to you? Yes. So now what happens is, suppose you, you discovered this distribution. What can you do with this? Do you notice that something beautiful? Suppose I had an engine that could take a point X. I gave you a point X. Uh, no, let me use a different color, neither blue nor pink. So that would be color, maybe green. Suppose I gave you a value X somewhere in this axis, somewhere from this to this range. And I had a machine that could generate, given X, it, given X, it could do, and it could tell that given this weight, I know that this looks like, a, let's say that the X is here. What would this machine infer? If it knew this distribution, would it be fair to say that if, if it was you, you would say, aha, I'm looking at a rather big, mighty, mighty duck, isn't it? And so you could produce the picture of a big, mighty duck. Right. Do you see that? In other words, if you knew the probability distribution of how the ducks are there, the moment you put that point, you can immediately tell duck, big duck, right? Even if you don't produce the image, you know it's a big duck. Make sense, guys? If I, on the other hand, took a, pic, a picture, a point like this, well, let me use some other color. What is left behind? Yellow. This, you would say, well, below average size cow. cow. 
Would you agree? Folks? Yes. Yeah, that is it. So what you have is when you know the entire distribution, the joint distribution of cows and ducks, right? In just in one dimension, just in size dimension, you can basically now take any point, not only the points that you have seen. So what may have happened is you were given about, let's say 20 ducks, right? So they occupied only 20 unique spots on the uh, size scale. And let's say 10 cows, or let's say uh, 10 or 15, 10 cows. That is what you learned from. But if what you learned is this thing, P, X, Y, if you learn the joint distribution, namely this picture, you're in a lovely position because now you, you, you have generalized beyond those 20 ducks and 10 cows. You can say a lot about cows of all sizes and ducks of all sizes, isn't it? Does that make sense? So that is the point of a generative model. Generative models generalize beyond data to create a joint, because they create a joint probability distribution, literally joint probability distribution. A very fancy way of saying, so guys, remember in mathematics, things tend to have in the beginning, a lot of jargon associated with it. It looks like jargon, unnecessary jargon, but later on, it turns out to be very efficient shorthand that mathematicians use to talk to each other, right? This is it. This is your mental picture. A joint product distribution is this. Am I making sense, guys? Right. Why do we? So I guess there's a. When you say something is a joint, generally you would think that it's a joint probability, right? But in this case, all we are saying is that this is how we are describing the whole probability, right? No, no, no. Let, let's take this example. What is the probability? Using this picture, can you answer this? Just, just uh, in a very intuitive way, tell me. Probability of a uh, x is equal to, let's say, thirty. Uh, uh, x is equal to one pound. Y is equal to cow. What would you say is the probability of this? Just looking at the picture. Zero. Yeah. So you were able to answer this question, isn't it? Okay. So knowing this distribution. Now you have a joint, joint probability. You can take any arbitrary combination of X and Y, right? If, if I say X is equal to uh, thousand, Y is equal to duck. Now, what do you say? Right. Okay. Right? And now you can say, uh, let me take this point. Uh, P, X is equal to, I don't know, a uh, hundred pounds, hundred. Y is equal to cow you would agree that this would be far more likely than this thing. And you would come up with a number, whatever the probability distribution is at this particular moment, right? So that is why it's called a joint probability distribution, right? Do you see how it answers the question anywhere, any arbitrary value of X and Y? So in other words, it looks at the joint space of X vector. Suppose X was in this case, R1. And why in this case, of course, is not a, a real number, but it is some category C1, generalization C1, C2. What you can do is for any combination of, you have an answer, isn't it? When you have an answer for any arbitrary co combination of X and Y, you say that you have a joint distribution. Making sense now? Yeah. That is it. So what generative models learn is, what this model, for example, learned are <coughs> the decoder part of a variation of encoder is that it learned somehow that uh, some distribution, and it says this point, any one point, I can tell what it is. It's a uh, if you say the probability that this point and it is a three, right, or something like that. And when you put it to the decoder process, it will actually render re-render it as a digit, right? It will decode it as a digit. Go from probability to a digit, right? So if you were to apply a decoder, for example, to this cows and ducks things, one would imagine that you would start producing uh, fairly interesting images of cows and ducks. So those are generative models. In the spirit of generative models, 
the GANs are the next more interesting step. Right? So uh, what I would like to do is, uh, I have been motivating the example of uh, cows, I mean, generative models. Let's take this as a checkpoint. Do we understand? Let, let's go back and see what we have understood. Generative models, generative adversarial networks. Now we explain both the worlds. Did we explain the adversarial nature of the networks? What are the two adversaries? Anyone would like to volunteer? What are the two adversaries in an adversarial network? Two enemies or two people who are trying to outdo each other. What are those? Generator and generator and the discriminator, or or in a, in colloquial words, the counterfeiter and the cop, right? That's how it is. the The cop is trying to tell whether the bill is real, but the generator is trying to produce as close to as indistinguishably um, a counterfeit that is almost indistinguishable from the real one. So that explains the word adversarial, and I explain the word generative. What, what generative models are? Isn't it? And because we are doing it using de uh, deep neural networks, these are, of course, uh, two enemy or uh, adversarial uh, neural networks that are fighting it out. Right? One trying to outdo the other, or be do better than the other. Just as in real life, the, the currency fakers, counterfeiters, they try to outdo the government, and the government tries to outdo the counterfeiters. Someone told me, I don't know how true it is, that it is almost impossible to counterfeit uh, modern US dollar bills. It has so many security things, it's nearly impossible. So people who counterfeit, I'm told, they go and counterfeit much older currencies from 20, 30, 40 years ago. Because you know they are, they are still valid tender, so I'm told. And someone told me this fact, I don't know if this is true, I'll, I'll use that as a break point for a 10, 15 minute break. Somebody told me that in US by law, if in a printer, you, color printer, you try to photocopy, uh, not, not a color printer, in a um, picture, yeah, I don't know, maybe in the printer also, but in a, a fax machine, well, not fax machine, photocopier, you try to photocopy a dollar bill, the automatically the law or some printers, or maybe all printers, I don't know what the situation is and I don't know how true it is, it will change the size of the image, right? It will know that you're trying to copy a currency and it will change the size. I don't know how true it is, but so I was told. Right? So uh, uh, instead of going to the photocopier, in case you have mischievous mind, uh, try the gen generative adversarial networks. <laughs> no, don't do it. <laughs> There's way too much. But, but anyway, we'll use this as an example to continue after this. Uh, so folks, look at this picture. What can you say about this picture? Yeah, does it look like uh, the photograph of a person? Okay. Yeah, it does. And what if I told you that this person does not exist? That this is not a photograph? Then just, just ponder over the subtle lighting and everything that you see around this person, isn't it very, very realistic? And yet, this is a picture that a generative model that has literally been produced by GANs. Isn't it amazing? So I will produce another picture. There it is. We have another picture now of a person. We can, this person too doesn't exist. And this doesn't exist. Right? And once you see enough of this, you have to ask, well, how do I tell which of these are real? It turns out that common man is not trained to detect fakes. And that is the big risk of artificial intelligence. Right, But even photographers, 50% of trained photographers cannot tell a photograph of a, a real genuine photograph from a fake or a generated fake. 
it needs some degree of training actually to be able to tell the subtle differences. In this picture, it turns out that the mistake is a bit obvious. Uh, look carefully at the way uh, this is attached to the ear. Earring, I believe it's called. And look at the way on this side it's attached. And do you see this artifact, this white artifact here? A real person would probably not have this. Do you see where my mouse is? Yeah, that's really... yeah. yeah, that's right. So it is, uh, when you look at images, you, you have to look at the subtle clues to figure out, you have to find regions where the AI has made a mistake, basically. Another region perhaps could be this, look at the background. Here, it has interpolated some artifact. Yeah, where my mouse is. So it is that, and you have to learn basically to, one thing that I find is, if you find that the image is too symmetric, human beings, human faces are never absolutely symmetric, right? So too much symmetry or too much asymmetry should get you a little, or very noticeable asymmetries or something should get you a little bit worried, right? This one, I can't easily tell. Yeah, what could be? So if you notice, this guy has a short haircut and nonetheless has hair hanging from below the ears. So either he had a bad barber, right? Or it's a fake things like that. So you have to go very subtle to find this. I invite you therefore to visit this website, which is called thispersondoesnotexist.com. Go there and play with it. And it's an informative site. It, it tells you like how to generate, like how to tell whether images are real or not. Quite often, like for example, if this is a child, the earrings, are a giveaway that something is off with this. Sometimes the background is off or things that are touching each other are off, right? The way they touch each other that or It's a little hard actually to tell fakes and it is getting harder and harder as this AI algorithms are becoming smarter and smarter. And sometimes it's a little easier. So let's, let's hope that the next image that generates, you can do it better. Is this easy to tell if this is fake? Can anybody see obvious markers? I'm not a very good observer. So I might miss it, but if anybody else is seeing something. So I think all the dots on the this, this side where your cursor is, it appears something on. Yeah, on the ear, there is a white marking. Right, even on the background, there's something on, on this side, yeah. Wall seems to have little chips, which may be real, which may, or maybe fake, but it does seem to be uh, odd that here there's so much texture on the wall, and here it's all just plain. And as you mentioned, right, the hair on the on the right hand side, uh, down below, around the neck. Oh yes, yeah. But she has it on the other side also. But not to uh, that extent. Yes. But sometimes it is a little bit, so it's tough. Do you see that it gets rather tough to tell the fakes? Here, what would you say is the telltale sign? I find no ear on the left. The is... headband and the hair seems to be merging yeah. on the top. A right. yeah. little bit of the, the merger is there between these two. So yeah, this is it. And it gets subtle, you know? Uh, I'm not a very observant person. I don't think I've ever looked at faces more carefully uh, in my entire life. But here it is very obvious. Can you see the way the fingers merge into the... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this one's bad. Yeah, this one is a really bad fake. Right? So... You mean good fake? Photoshop accident. Now this one, this is a good fake. The picture looks very realistic to me. Maybe the background is a little harder to tell. What do you mean by fake? You have to detect whether it's a photograph or it is a computer generated image. No, but the background or the front? The, the person a, or the background? The background. Okay. 
Yeah, something does not look too real. So there was a, a Kegel contest where they looked at the facial things and you had to, they looked at the wire print. I don't know, this I was asking you. Uh, looking at the eye position and all, because you can generate those also. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the data set is still available. So you yeah, have to figure out if it was real or not. Okay, interesting. So, so that would be a good good project if, yeah. uh, for people to play. If you can write a detector yeah. to classify whether something. So you, in other words, in our language of GAN, you're writing an efficient right. Right. That's right. discriminator. Yeah. Oh. So uh, anyway, fake, right? everything is fake. None of these are real. So I'm kind of trying to understand: is the the background fake or the person? Everything is fake. Right? Everything is fake. The eyes are fake. Everything is fake. Everything Everything is fake. Okay. And that is the amazing thing. So go to this website. This person does not exist. Okay. And can you imagine that machines, just a little bit of mathematics yeah. later, you end up with you end up with a machine that can produce, generate data like this. Right? This is scary. Yeah. yeah. So this is the power of GAN. So now that I have given enough to you about it. I hope I've piqued your interest to understand the mathematics, which we are going to do now. So how does this machine work? How do we do this? Like, see, remember I said that it is a game between two adversaries, the discriminator and the generator. So let's work out the technical details of how in the world this is even possible. Are we all ready for it now, guys? All game? Isn't it fascinating? You'll be surprised how easy the mathematics is. And this was the landmark paper of 2014 that started all of this. And uh, after that, uh, then there is style GANs. Oh, by the way, I didn't give an example. Maybe I should do that because the theory will continue for quite some time. Let me give an example of the style GANs, neural style transfer. Um, and guys, we will just download these models because it's very hard to train these models uh, on your own machine. So let me go and do style. I think Kate has a nice project on yes. the style transfer. Yes, yes. It was part of our project for 2020. Yeah. 2020, when we do the, did this course, it was actually a style GAN was part of the project. Yeah. Transfer, make, so Picard. So I'll give you an example of how these things work. Try on your own or JPEG or maybe neural style transfer is social media feed code, creative art. Uh, is this the website to do it with? Create. Let's go create. No, this is bad neural style. Plans for neural style. Okay. Turn your photos into high definition art. Get started. Do any one of you have a picture online? But I'll just take examples. We this can take quite some time to do it. But guys, you'll write this code when you do the uh, computer and the vision part. You will be doing all of this as your homework. And even now you'll do a simplified version as your lab work. So look at this original picture. Is the picture of a person? Right. Uh, let's go here. This is the picture of a person. You're taking a Van Gogh style and you're asking Van, this uh, style GAN to render the original picture as though Van Gogh would have painted it. And I'll let you decide whether it looks realistic Van Gogh or not. To me, it does, but... Uh, Asya, what's the name of the site again? There are many such things, neuralstyle.art. Right. Uh, again, as I said, there are many, many such sites. Play with that, guys. Huh? People are even trying to create art and sell it. Like, they will take your picture, make it into Van Gogh's art or, or you know, Monet's art. So, and then they will say, we'll print and send it to you and we'll charge you this much. Which is that website where you write text and it generates uh, art? Oh, oh, that is the DALI. DALI. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that is that is a lit, that's beyond gas. It's a yeah. it's a different neural architecture. We'll come to that. Okay. okay. Dali, by the way, has a when I did cover Dali on the Sunday research. Uh -huh. Now there's a Dali two. Okay. So it's already so in I a second up generation. For that. I don't know if they approved or not. This okay. Is invite, but we do. So yeah. yeah. You should play with that. I so posted to Slack a couple still shots from my neural style app. Okay, so uh, anyway, that is a different neural architecture, but since Sachin brought it up, I'll show it to you guys, huh? Dal. Become very popular. Yeah, Dali is, a, uh, let's say, what you can do is, you can create, use this to create impossible things. For example, I think there is a way to render it also, right? Uh, yeah. There's a website where you can enter text. Yes. Uh, what is the URL for that? API. API. No. Yes. Uh, to build next Absolutely. No, 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 not this one. Uh, so what they've done is they've given credits to people. So yeah. like you burn credits pretty fast, right? Yeah. Uh, How to use it. So anyway, I do I can't quickly. This is by the way, with some of the things we will do in computer vision. In the computer vision class, these are real things. So I don't want to jump the gun yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, you can play around with it on your own. I won't jump the gun, but the bottom line is you can ask the system to do impossible things. You can say, uh, create a chair in the shape of an avocado. Yes. And yes. it will create all yes. sorts of beautiful yes. chair designs yes. Yes. that people wouldn't have thought of yeah. into, the, into the shape of an avocado. And that is the amazing thing. Like uh, the website of this, but that is, but uh, that is beyond just yeah. GAN. So yeah. we we need a little bit more. GAN is a, a Dali is an architecture in itself. So do you notice this here? An armchair in the shape of an avocado, and it produces this chair designs. And most of you would agree this looks pretty realistic, isn't it? Would you all agree that this looks realistic? Right. You can say an illustration of a baby daikon radish in a tutu walking a dog. You can ask for the most impossible situations and it will start doing it, right? So the world has moved and you can do like, for example, would you be able to tell that these are not real pictures? A storefront that has the word open AI written on it. Yeah. Right? Look at this. Right. Asif, I posted the link where you can type text and uh, get images, yeah, on Slack. Yeah, very good. Nice. Now you can make sketches and you can say, well, render this sketch into a picture, into a real photograph. And so, you know, you drew these cats and it became, it became exact text prompt as a sketch AI generated images, et cetera, the exact same. Yeah. So let, let's go with the link Kyle has now posted. Uh, this is a mini one. Okay. Uh, let's do that. It is worth, guys, for you guys to get interested. Let's say, uh, I will say, let's see. This is a mini gun. It may not be as accurate or as good. As the sorry, not mini gang. It's a mini dally. It may not be as uh, effective, but we'll see. It does take time. It does take time. It will come yeah, through. Say, After say, say, yeah. yeah. So that's right. By the way, guys. Why don't we do this? Dali was not part of this course, but if you want, I can make it one of your homeworks. I can give you the. You um, want to hear a tidbit about Gan? Um, go ahead. Gan, uh, good fellow. So uh, if you are saying, could you come closer to this oh. so everybody can hear it? So basically, yeah, come by. Gan, yeah, good fellow, right? No, no, hang on, hang on. Come, come by closer. Actually, come up to the stage so everybody can hear you. So, can you hear now? Yeah, I think people, uh, remote guys, can you hear him, Sachin? Yeah, so the yes. night, so there was a week where the guy who did um, GAN networks, right? So he was saying the way, the two, three days before, he was having a very intense discussion with another two guys. 
and they were somewhere in Stanford or somewhere. And he actually got a brain stroke. Mm-hmm. So he was admitted in the hospital. He was there for a week. And he says he's lucky to have come back like thick. And all the work that he did is collection of whatever he remembered prior to that, before the stroke. Mm -hmm. So essentially, the amount of math involved and the thinking involved is so, that's his dissertation, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's that's why I wanted to say that how complex it is. Yes. So so he was almost, so he said that I was feeling that my life's work is going to like, I may not remember anything. (laughs) So whatever he wrote is... What is he remembered it? the prior, the week before, before where they had this intense discussion. discussion in the garage or somewhere. So he says it was like the most smallest of place and they kind of went over two, three nights nonstop. Wow. So, wow. So, yeah. <laughs> the lesson is must sleep. Huh? Must sleep. But, but Don't he said that sleep. his brain was so, he says it's from that intense thinking that he most likely got it because it must have been. What do you call it? very emotional and you know that's how he got the gans yeah yeah so he was sick <laughs> literally lost my life for the gans is what he said so. very interesting so guys we got a monkey with a banana with banana in its hands how many of you would consider that this looks pretty realistic yeah isn't it but yeah it looks great <laughs> But what if we made it something completely odd? Something what doesn't eat bananas? Fish. A fish eating. What's that? As for a horse with noodle legs, and these are not convincing. Okay. A fish eating bananas. Eating and apple. Let's try this. Fish. A fish doesn't eat apple. Uh, it might come back after some time. And this is the last example. After that, we'll go. But by the way, Dali is a different architecture. It's based on the idea. You can see the evolution of generative models, guys. We just talked about generative models. What the mathematics is so simple in, a, in some sense. It is just joint probability distributions. And you're causing a machine to learn this joint probability distribution. Mm-hmm. Well, here it is. Oh. <laughs> Not realistic, so it made it oh. cartoon. <laughs> yeah, it looks but, pretty but, cartoonish. But this is how kids draw, right? I mean, like yeah. anything, and then yeah. you ask them, and they say, "Oh, there's a fish eating something." Right? Uh, That's right. <clears throat> the fish has its mouth open, trying to eat, and there's a there's an apple nearby. It's okay. <laughs> yes, with a worm in it. <laughs> Animation jobs will be lost. Huh? <laughs> Guys, programmers. But programming itself now, these generative models, you probably know the GPT-3 and many of these transformers, they're writing code and they're writing much better code than most developers write. So world is changing very rapidly, guys. AI is eating the world for lunch. If you're not doing AI, in some form or the other, get ready to change your profession. Okay, so now for the mathematics of it. Let's work through it. You'll be surprised at how amazingly simple the mathematics for this is. It is simple only if you understand it, of course. It is not really simple, but we'll try to make it simple. So once again, let's getting back to theory and brass tacks. We have two core entities. We have the generator. What the generator does is, given an input z, right? you give it some arbitrary input, or input goes this. Uh, this is called a latent vector. It's something hidden. Hidden means it's hidden from the discriminator, hidden from the output. You don't see it. right? So you do that. It will produce a output g of z. So you say, all right. Uh, so, some arbitrary function g, it will do a transformation of the input. Now, what you want to do is, let's say that you're looking at a picture, like we took a count, a count of, but by the way, don't take counterfeit bill as example. I don't want to be the guy who created a whole bunch of counterfeiters, currency counterfeiters. So we will use, and as all textbooks do, they use uh, handwriting digits as their typical example. So no counterfeiting currency bills, right? Um, 
obviously, uh, I don't think it's even legal. Like uh, photocopying or even taking pictures of currency bills, to my understanding, is illegal. I think the printer doesn't print it. That's what people say. I don't know. Printer doesn't it. print it. Huh? Yeah. And if you if, if you photocopy it, yeah, it changes the geometry yes, of it. Yes, yes, right, something like that. So, um, so we'll take digits. We have all these handwriting digits. Are we guys familiar with the handwriting digits? And by the way, they know when it is printed from which printer it came. From. Oh yes, the the code gets embedded somewhere. Yes, yes. So, yeah. So that people know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, thank goodness! Imagine what an economic disaster it would be if people could. Actually, I I I am told that government has a whole branch which tries to protect the integrity of currencies yes. because it would be an economic collapse yes, yes, yes. without it. Yes. Thank goodness there. I mean, every time I look at a new currency bill, I'm thoroughly impressed. Yes. Like it's just amazing how much technology goes into it. Anyway, so here we go. This is your cop, discriminator. Discriminator. What the discriminator will get, there's a pile of real data. Right, so real data. So think of real digits sitting here. Uh, this typically in the literature is considered X. X represents genuine data. Oh yeah, turn off the lights. Oh. Genuine data. Yeah, no, the lower one, the lower one. This one. Yes. So genuine data is X. What it produces now? Uh, no, 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 I don't want this one. Oh, you don't want this. Okay, then I just this up. Yes. Okay. This is it. So the input to this system could be either this or this. Never at the same time, of course. And now the cop's job is y hat is real, which will mark as one, fake which will mark as zero. It will predict something close to it. So in other words, let's say that it predicts y is equal to 0 0.98, right, y hat. What is it trying to say? A y hat is closer to one or zero. At this moment, it's very close to one. So it is, the discriminator is saying that most likely this is a real, a real digit, all right? It's a real data. It's not a fake data. All right, for the sake of our um, storytelling, we'll continue with the currency as an example. <laughs> so now, what happens is, in can the I beginning- ask you a question? Go ahead. How does the discriminator know it is real or fake? Uh, it's whether it is zero or one, unless it knows the universe of all the possible combinations. Yes, yes. We're coming to that. We're coming okay, to that. Okay. We're coming to that. So all we know is that this discriminator. So let's go to the discriminator since you asked that question. We, we are building up the mathematical terminology carefully here. Discriminator, and I'll write in smaller handwriting if it is not visible on the screen of those of you who are remote, please let me know. Discriminator. What the discriminator will do is it will take a real for real data x it produces discriminator will produce let's say y hat y hat is equal to d of x let's say some function of x it does some transformation because the neural network is a function right so it will produce a d of x all right and it, what you want to do is when you want to train it, you want to say that the loss of the discriminator for real data is a loss between the real, the prediction dx. You want dx to be as real as possible, right? Y real. Y real may be one, but I'm just writing it in a, a notation because it could be one, two, three, four, five, multi class, right? So you want to say the probability of it being real versus real. That would be the gap would be the loss function. In other words, the loss function of the discriminator for real data is low loss if dx is essentially y real. So far so good guys, this is standard classification. Are we together? Yes. 
And the, 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 a classification problem, this is typically, this could be a logic, basic logic, uh, the uh, <coughs> a, a, a binary, if it is just two class classification, real fit, binary cross entropy loss. Remember what was your binary class? It was basically log of dx, right? Multiplied by y real, this uh, for real data. Now for fake data, data, let me uh, do, do this for real data. For fake data, what do you want? Fake data, what is the input? Input is, input is coming from the generator, right? Input is G of Z. So output, it is basically D of input. And so it is equal to D of G of Z. Isn't it? So what do you want? If you want to do the loss part here, loss for the, so let me just call it real, a D discriminator fake will be, basically you, what do you want to minimize? You want to minimize D of G of Z and compare it to what? It should be very close to what? Why? Fake, it should be able to tell that this is fake, isn't it? If you give it a fake data as input, you want the discriminator function to predict that it is fake, isn't it? In other words, you want ideally D of the fake data, discriminator function on the fake data to produce the result saying that this is basically close to fake, it is fake. So while training, we do know, uh, we do have these labels. Yeah, while fake. know that. In training, we know whether we are feeding a real data or we are feeding a fake data. Okay. Are we together? So discriminator will try to maximize its ability to tell the fake and the real apart. Isn't it? It's trying to maximize this. What is the counterfeiter hoping on the other hand? The counterfeiter is trying to counterfeit a bill in such a way that the discriminator has a hard time telling the two apart. Make sense? The counterfeiter is trying to minimize the gap between the real and the fake. Uh, sorry, between the counterfeit and uh, yeah, yeah, the, the counterfeit and the real thing. It's trying to make the counterfeit look as much real as possible. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. So now let's look at the loss function. So the total loss function for the, uh, so for discriminator, so for discriminator, the loss uh, for one item, one item of data, whether it's real or not, the loss of the discriminator would be the basically trying to minimize the gap between the real data and Y real plus the gap between a fake date, fake uh, D prediction on a fake data and Y fake, right? These are the two terms. And now, you, you agree with this part, guys? So far for the discriminator, this is, this is for the real part and this is for the fake, right? If you minimize both of these things, it can tell the real as real and take the uh, tell the fake as fake. It's a winning discriminator. It's a winning cop, right? It's a good Sherlock Holmes. Would you agree, right? So you say, well, now the, the point is we glossed over something. What did we gloss over? Uh, in reality, when you train a neural network, you give it a mini batch of data, right? Endpoints or batch of data or something like that, uh, or mini batch or whatever it is. In each step of learning, uh, when you do gradient descent, you need to give it endpoints. So and now let's bring in the uh, those uh, summations and other things over. So more properly, 
when considering a batch size, actually it should be mini batch size n, loss over d, loss function of the discriminator is the usual thing, average loss over i is equal to one to n of the same thing, guys. Can I just leave it as that? Right. So this previous one, this entire thing, I don't need to write it. So you assume that it is there, that's it. Right? So you have to remember that you have to take care of that. Uh, no, that's all right. But what about the, genera the generator? Generator has an opposite goal. Generator says, you know what? Every time I produce, you take some input Z, latent vector, it becomes GZ. What would it like to do? And this GZ is given to the discriminator. It becomes D of G of Z, right? This is the Y hat that's produced, Y hat. The loss function, you want to minimize, you want Y hat here of the fake, so Y hat of fake, what do you want? You want it to look as close to real, Y real as possible, isn't it guys? You want it to look like the real thing. Does this make sense? The generator, the counterfeiter would like to produce such a, such a data point, GZ, such that when you pass it to the discriminator, the whole thing begins to smell like real, the real deal. Would you agree? So it, it should resemble some real value, some real, right? Discriminator should, basically you, you need to fool the discriminator into the belief that this is real. So you want a loss function, the loss of a, for the generator. Generator of course never sees the real data, real data it ignores. It basically wants to have a minimize the gap between D of G of Z and Y real. In other words, it wants to fool the discriminator into believing it is real. So, uh, you you have a winner if, for example, this turns out to be 0 0.99, right? Discriminator says, I have 99% confidence that this is a real, that this is a real data point, or this is a real currency, let's say, right? In that case, the counterfeiter has won, isn't it? Would you agree? He just successfully produced a currency that is being considered real by the cop, by the discriminator. And that is the goal of the counterfeiter. Would you agree, guys? Yeah, yeah. that is it. So the loss yeah. of that. And then obviously, to be more precise, again, with n sample in, mini, in batch, what do you need to do? Loss is just being more precise, is equal to one over n of the loss of d, g, z, y real summation over i is equal to one to n right the usual stuff huh? i won't i won't uh, go over the point so guys it, it looks without interpretation uh, this board that i just produced here this might look like confusing but i want you to absorb this with the explanation that i gave tell me if the entire mathematics looks self evident to you at this particular moment the way it's written What's that first character in the generator? Is that Z? Or? Z. Z is the input, whatever input. So I have been silent about what the input is. Why is why is it, why should it be literate? Yeah, the reason for that is uh, means something goes into the generator that makes it produce GC. Now I have been silent about it. Anything that you can't see is considered latent. Means it's internally generated and given to the generator. So typically, what happens is typically. Oh, so, so, oh, okay. So what you mean is there's a box outside of it which you cannot yeah. see. It's not something that is coming from yeah. real world. It is self-generating yeah. and then giving it to you. Generate. Yeah, for GANs, okay. what happens is that for GANs, most GANs, uh, GANs, Z is 
nothing but sampled from the normal distribution, zero one, right? It's basically noise. That's why it's called Z is basically a Gaussian noise sample, right? You just sample instance. You just take a bell curve and randomly pick a point and you pass it to the generator. So why I'm asking this is, yeah. I wanted to generate cartoon images for the medical application, right? which actually looked like the real tissue sample. And my take was this, rather than generating this random way, mm -hmm. you actually take it from the biology properties and generate it. Mm. So that oh. I talked to this guy who runs the Google mind, right? Mm -hmm with him saying that how do you care like from where I got it mm -hmm. as long as I'm able to take the real one and make it look like the real tissue sample mm -hmm. because I know what the, that structure and all is known because you know in nature like the tissue is not going to go so rather than taking this long route to generate it why can't we from a smaller subset of known data generate it but then have the discriminator be able to uh, fix it because then you can generate within uh, 5,000 or 10,000, 100,000 images, you can create a larger set to train it. You see what really happens, Sachin, is these GANs are very effective. Yes. So the training that takes a while, but right. it doesn't take that long. What you are referring to is beginning to look like something, a variation of GAN called conditional GANs. Okay. In conditional GANs, you are more particular. You say, you don't just give it a random noise, uh -huh. but you actually give it an instance. You feed it the label. Yes. You say that, yes. okay, this is what Y should look like. Correct. Try to imitate this. Yes, yes, yes. It, those are conditional GANs. Conditional, okay. Right, and they, they work. So as I said, the GAN world is very rich. Okay. Right? It's a whole world in itself. You enter that world and you, you can just stay lost in it okay. for a very long time, reading all the papers. Uh -huh. There are entire websites devoted to um, the all the different uh, research papers and varieties of GAN, right? And now what I would suggest, and this is what this will be your lab, the GAN. So the lab that I'll do will write a GAN from first principle. That's okay. But in practice, what you do is, for example, Py, PyTorch Hub, PHub, uh, it has already but well trained GAN models. Mm. So for example, the there is a, a Facebook has contributed a GAN that produces very the same pictures that you were saying, this person does not exist, uh -huh. something like that. It will produce it for you, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the lab exercises that we will do in this, uh, in this is, uh, we will uh, try to uh, use it, play with it, and see how well it works in this course, because here we are more focused on the foundations, on the mathematics, on the theory. But uh, later on, when you come to the computer vision class, we will go really deep into the image related GANs mm -hmm. very seriously, image and video related GANs will go into it more seriously and uh, we will study it much more. Right? So, uh, again, you know, first, you know, crawl, walk, run kind of a thinking. So, this course, as I again said, is foundational. So, now you say, well, this is lovely. Now, this mathematics that I wrote, guys, once again, please tell me that uh, this page read it. I'll give you a few minutes to absorb it. Don't be shy. Tell me if I, if I need to re-explain something. I'll be happy to do that. Anything that you guys want me to explain? Anyone who feels they understood it, let's ask the question in the reverse way. So Z is in N, which is natural no, no, N is the no, uh, uh, Gaussian, bell curve, Gaussian noise. normal noise, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're just picking something, a sample from a normal distribution, that's all. Yeah. And this is the magical thing. So guys, observe something very interesting. The generator, the counterfeiter actually never gets to see the real data mm -hmm. in the classical form. It's a very difficult task. So what will, it, what will happen is, in the beginning, the discriminator will win, right? Because what will the generator produce? Generator will produce, let's say you're talking about digits. Generator will produce some random image with dots and white spaces there. And it will try to pass it off as a digit. The, the discriminator, what will it do? 
it will very, very easily be able to tell the real from the fake because in the beginning, whatever the generator is producing is essentially very close to noise. Right? Uh, are we seeing this? So the discriminator has to be faithful in this thing not to trick the generator, right? Yes. That is right. All that the discriminator does is discriminator is just a classifier. Right. That's all. Right. It's a pure classifier. Right. Now what happens is, so it is happily saying, yikes, this is not, for example, the book, for example, says nine with a tail. Yeah. The discriminator says uh, nines don't have a tail, horizontal tail at the bottom, right? So you throw it out. <coughs> and then after a little while, the gradient of the loss, when you back propagate, it is now drifting towards one of those states or one of those images by shifting the the random patterns in such a way that now it is becoming more structured. It's beginning to produce a shape that discriminator does not produce so much loss on because you're doing gradient of the loss. All that the generator needs to do is change the image slightly, right? And then see how much loss comes out. Hmm. If the loss is less, good. Now I need to change it a little bit more and I can keep changing the loss use the gradient descent and so on and so forth, the generator can keep shifting the, or shifting the shapes till the loss gets really minimized, right? And what happens is that generally the discriminator wins in a classical GAN. Discriminator, the cop is always better than the counterfeiter, which is true in real life also, right? The, the whole reason that you don't have counter currencies happily floating around, thank God, is because the, the, the people who can detect it are far, far smarter, right? They have better technology and they know it. So discriminator has a much easier job. All it has to do is classify. A generator has a much harder job. Generator has no clue what real data looks like, but it is trying to learn it through back propagation, right? So, a discriminator generally outperforms the generator, but all that the generator will do is it will make sure that generator doesn't outperform it by too significant a margin. It will decrease the margin so that it ultimately takes you to a state at which the discriminator does make mistakes. So some counterfeits begin to look real. But even at that stage, the goal of this, while you produced a discriminator and a generator, the, the point is not to create not to defeat the discriminator, discriminator will always do a little bit better. And there's a mathematical reason because discriminator does quite literally a discri uh, See, I, the word discriminator comes from the discussion that I just gave, namely that it is a classifier is a discriminant model, right? Whereas the generator does a joint probability distribution. Joint probability distributions are always harder to compute. Generative models are always harder to build. And the generator has a harder task. So the discriminator begins to win. Now, unfortunately, it leads to a problem in GANs, which is called mode collapse. It's been a pretty serious problem. What the mode collapse means is that, see, once the generator, let's say that you have nine, 10 digits, right? zero to nine. Once the generator, Let's say that uh, produces something that looks like a zero and the loss function begins to minimize. Guess what is in the best interest of the generator to keep the loss function low? It can just go on producing more and more zero-like things <coughs> because it has learned to produce good zeros. Oh, correct, right. right? So it will basically say it is safe for me to just produce zeros because anything else I produce looks wrong. Let me produce zeros. So it won't produce other things very much. So you'll see this in the lab, the classical GAN, it will produce some of the easy, easy digits. <coughs> well, a zero, three, maybe eight. Some of the ones, it will tend to produce much more. And it will not produce harder ones like four, et cetera, et cetera. Some things that are harder, it won't produce so much of that, right? So what has happened is the generator has gone through a mode collapse. The word mode collapse is very interesting. I'll explain the word mode collapse. So why, why is that? Yeah, I'm explaining that. Huh? Yeah, so imagine that, uh, so again, let's say that you're trying to do, let's bring back the example of cows and ducks, uh -huh. right? So 
Let's go back to our example of cows and ducks. So you have the cows here and you have the ducks here. Let us say that the generator has learned to produce this, the ducks, right? In the beginning, the better it does, it produces ducks, it learns, it does gradient descent. So soon it will learn how to produce ducks. But then when it comes to cows, it, it, it tries to predict something here, something here, something here, uh, and, it, and it is getting much greater loss, right? So what may happen? Well, cows and ducks are just two class, so it will probably succeed. But when you take the nine digits, zero to nine, what will happen is, think of it like that. There may be something, there may be something else, let's say three, zero, and that it's, it sort of samples and produces this, and it gets low loss loss. So it, it sort of encourages the GAN to produce more of threes or try to produce more of threes in lies. Because if you look at the loss function that we related, that we wrote, look at the loss function. All it is doing is trying to minimize the gap between what it produces and a real one. Mm -hmm. So, so long as it keeps producing what it has learned produces low loss, it is doing very well. So it tends to overlearn in limited areas. The word more stands for most frequent area. So because these are bell curve distributions, more is peaked. So what it means is that uh, it will pick up a few of the classes that it learns early on to get it right. And it will just keep producing more and more samples of that. Does the, does the reasoning seem reasonable? If you were faking it, right? You have to fake currencies, $1 bill, what is the next bill? Is there a $5, $5 bill? $5, 10. 5, 10. There are twos, but not many. Not many. And maybe $100 bill. So is there a, yeah, there's a $20 bill, $50, $100, right? Is there a $1,000 bill? I'm told there's one for bank transfer, yeah, interbank, yeah, interbank or something like that. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. So let's say that you have a lot of bills. You, you have been trying to fake all of them. And it is hard, you know, a thousand, a hundred dollar bill is really hard to counterfeit. And now you take bills for many generations, you know, 19, 2000s and 2020s and 1980s and so forth. You, know, you, you will soon figure out it's a lot easier to fake something in the 1980s, let's say one dollar bills of 1980s, rather than hundred dollar bills of 2022, right? So what will be your tendency? You will go where, you know, you'll exploit. So between the exploitation, exploration uh, so spectrum. So it's not learning one digit at a time? Like zero? No, 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 no. It so is all, it's learning one. 10 digits? Yeah, all, all right. zero to nine, all of them. Because the image that is fed into the jet, into the discriminant could be any one of those digits, real digits, when you train it. Right, no, but what prevents you from learning how to fake a zero first, then fake a one first? Okay, no, 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 you don't. That is gets into conditional GANs. No? Then, then you're saying, let me fake, let me train it to do each digit separately. Right, right. No, you don't do that. What you typically in a traditional GAN, what you do is you can take any one of the real digits. Uh -huh. And now you say generator generates something that looks like this. Okay. And you look at the gap between I the two. Right. So what happens typically is because you're averaging over N samples, you just need to get the easiest one. The easiest one's right, and you have you are doing pretty well, right? And so that's what happens. That's a mode collapse problem. So what you need to do is, and there's more to it. Like what happens is that there is because we use a sigmoid in the generator. There's a bit of technicality. You you have the problem of vanishing gradients and so on and so forth. Uh, we won't let's not get into too much of that. So now we understand what mode collapse is. <coughs> Just keeps producing samples for a subset of the real data, right? So in other words, real data classes. Suppose digits are there, zero, a three will start predominating, and I don't know what else is there. Eight will still still start predominating. So these things will start predominating, and some other things won't get done at all, right? Or will be done very poorly. 
So that is mode collapse. So how do you prevent the mode collapse? What we need to do is we need to handicap the discriminator. It has undue advantage, right? It has a much simpler problem to solve. You need to add some penalty terms to it, right? Handicap it in some way. So there are many, many techniques to handicap it. One of the techniques that is a, a fairly popular and uh, is and, re, and not very old actually. I believe it has just come out in the last couple of years, two three three years or so. Or four, maybe I'm wrong, but in my knowledge, it has just come out in the last three four years. It the, is the Wasser style. Let me hope I give it the Wasserstein GAN GAN using a gradient. Uh, gradient penalty. So let me say Wasserstein was obviously the creator of this. Uh, uh, he has a concept called the Wasserstein distance and so forth. We created this concept. GAN is gone. This is gradient penalty. Now that is quite a well, you look at it, it's pretty scary. And, and by the way, I have explained the math in a way that is intuitive. At some point, I'll put it in the very scary formal way that you see it in papers and you'll see that they are exactly the same. So uh, this particular thing, what it does is, it says that discriminant, the loss function of the discriminant, let us change it a little bit. We make it the loss function of the discriminant and uh, just forgive me for not putting all those one over n and averaging and all of that. Uh, I'm skipping that, guys. I'm just being sloppy, right? And uh, what it is is that you're saying that discriminate this b is the g of z. So what do you want? You want this thing, discriminant g of z, when this number is high, like let's say that you produce a fake and um, a discriminant says a high number, 0 0.99 probability that it is, uh, it is real. And then it has gotten it wrong, isn't it? Would you agree? Then it has gotten it wrong. So loss, it is, there is more loss. Then there is one more term. There is the a D of X. Now, here high number is good or bad? Dx, if you say the probability that it is real for a real data point, the number goes from zero to one, no? in the range of zero to one. Is a high Dx good or bad for real data? Good for the generator or good for no, no, what? For the discriminator. We are only looking okay. at the discriminator. So discriminator would be happy, right? when uh, dx is large. And so if I put a negative sign, basically you're saying, uh, because it's good, let's have a negative penalty for it. High positive penalty when it is wrong for the fake, negative penalty when it is right for a genuine one. So these two terms are pretty much understandable, right? But then what it does is it adds a term which is scary. <laughs> so that's one way to put it. What it does is it takes the gradient of the discriminant value, <clears throat> but what it does is it is a, so remember this is fake data, fake. This is real. Now what it says is it takes a data that is a mixture of fake and real. So what is real data? X. What is fake data? G of Z. Would you agree? G of Z is the fake that the generator is producing. And it is saying, uh, take some arbitrary mixture of the real and the fake. So how do you do that? Here is a little bit of mathematics that you should know. Suppose I have a, a value, a vector, a value, uh, let's say 10, and I have a value here, 20. And I say, uh, pick an arbitrary point that is a mix that is somewhere between 10 and 20. Are we together? So for that, what you can do is you can say, let me go 
and take this uh, thing. You would say that, hey, let me go some arbitrary distance. So this distance is 20 minus, actually, let me make it 25. Uh, 25 minus 10 is the distance, isn't it? So you say that I need to do some arbitrary amount of distance I need to go towards 25 from 10. Would you agree with that? To get to an arbitrary point x, x would be epsilon times d plus 10. 10 because the, the, it's, you're starting out at 10. Right? The, the, given the fact that origin is here, 0, would you agree that this distance, x, is epsilon times d plus 10? 10 is the starting one. Do you agree with that, guys? Seeing this picture? Right. So epsilon is a number between 0 and 1? That... Yeah. yeah. So oh, it's okay. some fraction between 0 and 1. What you're basically saying is that go some part of the distance, the complete distance from 10 to 20, the total distances. So let me draw it out again. 0, 10, and to some value. I'll just take 25, right? Now you're saying if I want some point x in this interval, right? So let's say x is this. x is this. Now the question is, what is the value of x? How would you do that? So you would say x is equal to, would you agree that it is this distance plus some arbitrary fraction of the distance from this? So the distance between 10 and 20, 25 is 25 minus 10, right? Right. So let me just call this A, B. Now let's generalize it. Distance is equal to A min, A min, B minus A. And any point X, X is an arbitrary point. You multiply the D by some number in the between 0 and one. So if you multiply d by zero, right, uh, you, 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 you're not adding anything to it. Now you say x is equal to, uh, sorry, uh, d. So first of all, you have to add 10 because you are starting from 10, 10 plus. Would you agree that this will take you to some point in this range? x will be in the right, right place between a and b. Does this make sense, guys? It's very simple algebra. Guys? Yeah, it makes sense. It makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it does. Right. Simple makes sense, right? So uh, any number between zero and one, and let, let's call this epsilon. Well, epsilon, I don't want to use the word epsilon. Is, suppose I use the word epsilon with this symbol, which belongs to, because it's so close to each other. Let me use another symbol. Huh? Let me use alpha. Alpha belongs to? the interval 0 to 1. It can be anywhere between 0 to 1, right? So x is equal to 10 plus alpha times d. But what was d? d was, uh, sorry, and now I can replace this 10 with a, a. So this, what was 10? Can I replace it with the real value, which was uh, a, generalize it, a plus alpha d. So now a plus alpha, what is d? b minus a. And so this equation becomes, it becomes alpha B plus one minus alpha A, right? So any arbitrary point can be written as like this. Am I making sense? I'm just rearranging the terms. And so uh, now in, in, the, in your notation, Suppose I, so this was X, actually, let me not use X because, because X in our notation is, uh, I want to bring it back to the mathematics. Um, let me use Q, some Q point, Q, this is Q. Um, let me not use, because I'll tell you why I'm not using X. I don't want to mix up the notation, Q. So Q is this. Now let's map it to what we have. 
A and B are two arbitrary vectors, right? So if I give you two vectors, X and G of Z, A is equal to X, B is equal to G of Z. And I ask you to point, create a mixture, something that is in between the real and the fake. Real X and the fake. Right. What would you do? You would say, well, that is easy. I need to take and replace epsilon. Now, I used alpha. So in, in, in this, in GANs, W GANs, it is common to use epsilon rather than alpha. Just a change of notation. Huh? So then you would say, well, that is easy. All I need to do is epsilon of one of the things, B plus one minus epsilon A, right? Mm -hmm. Or you could interchange the two, it doesn't matter, right? One way or the other. And so that is what it actually, the way the GANs do it, they do it the other way around. They call this, uh, so here's the thing. Okay, A, uh, let me leave it as A. Uh, actually, I gave the notation as, uh, suppose I make B here, here, and A to be this in our argument, doesn't matter. So from fake to real. Right. So what would happen is this would become epsilon X plus one minus epsilon G of GZ. Would you agree guys? Mm -hmm. Right. So this is now this vector, let me call this vector, the M vector mixture is a mix of real and fake. Are we together? So suppose what, instead of giving either the real as input or the fake as input, now you're giving the discriminator, the cop, a much more advanced problem to solve. So you're hand air brushing, right? What's that? You're air brushing the real image, say with some noise in it. Yes, like in a way. A big Yes, Big that is one way to do it. You take a real person and uh, maybe you add a mustache to that person. Slightly fake it, all right? Suppose you do that. And now you ask the discriminator, well, is this real or fake, right? Mm -hmm. So the discriminator will say, Nater, the cop, poor fellow, what is the best it will do? It will say G M, mm -hmm. G M, right? Well, this is good. It makes some prediction. Uh, no, not G M. Sorry, uh, what nonsense? A uh, D M, discriminant. Discriminant does D M, right? D of the a mixed vector. Now you say, ah, oh, but how sensitive are you to this entire faking business, right? Like how much does your decision change by adding very small amount of fake? You know, when I'm sliding between the real and the fake spectrum, how sensitive are you really to this? Mm -hmm. So remember sensitivity, one of the measures of sensitivity is the gradient, right? So let me uh, do that. So let me ask this question this way. Let me leave it this way. A discriminant poor fellow will say, now we say, how sensitive is the discriminator, discriminator for M? Like for small changes in M, how much does it change his decision, right? So that would be like, for example, remember that if you have a function, just to wait your recollection, <laughs> if you have a function, and you have a steep gradient, steep uh, slope. What does it mean? Small changes of value will lead to large changes of the y. Would you agree? If this is x, small changes of 
where the slope is high, small changes of x will lead to vast changes of y. In other words, the derivative and its generalization, the gradient, they are measures of sensitivity of the function to changes in the input. Mm. That's the best way to think. That's the best intuition you can carry about a gradient or a, this thing. So, well, how sensitive? This will be given by d of m, right? And pretty much we are getting very close to the main intuition, which says that our, the, 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 the function is, we don't want this sensitivity to be too high, right? So what we do is we say, hey, let's add a penalty term. Remember in the L2 regularization that we did yesterday night, what was the penalty term? Weight squared, the circle, right? So uh, the weight squared, right? WI, squared was the up to a lambda parameter. So that weight of the model is somewhat analogous to that for regularization. So it is basically regularization. You say a dm, right, squared. And then you say, you, you, you further subtract it from this value you want it to be closer to one for reasons. The rest of it is technical detail. So you want to do that and then you square it. And then uh, this is the L2 norm. Right? This is the L2 square root, right? Or simply put, it is gradient of dm. People write it with two, right? This means the rich reg term, regularization term or L2 norm. Right? And this goes, for, goes to the uh, regularization theory that you have learned from me. This is it. So what you do is this is your penalty term. Now what happens, remember ridge regularization always has a lambda parameter. So therefore, let's bring in that lambda also. So you have this gradient of D of M, right? Ridge regularized minus one squared, right? You treat this as your penalty factor. So your penalty has a gradient. It is a gradient penalty. The, the more sensitive the, <coughs> the discriminator is to small changes between fake and real, the more you penalize it. You don't want it to go. So the end result is you make, you sort of add a handicap to the comp, right? So it's like, um, uh, by doing that, you give more of a chance for the counterfeiter to catch up, to basically learn to outdo it, right? Or come closer to it. So that, that solves partly the mode collapse problem. It's not a fully solved problem, but it does make it better. Now, that is a lot of, uh, lot of things. Now let's rewrite this term in the conventional language that is written. What is a D of the gradient of the discriminator of the, what function, what was M? M was epsilon X vector, plus one minus epsilon g of gz. Remember, this is what m was, if you remember, a vector. And the now the equation begins to look, when you put all the pieces together, it's not hard, but it does begin to look rather, um, let me make this equation squared. This is the penalty factor, penalty. And now let's write the total loss function for the discriminant. Discriminator, you have the loss of the discriminator is literally, what is that? Remember the original terms, you want to encourage it to, where is it? You want to encourage it to, uh, recognize fake as fake. So you, the more, the, the higher value it gives to fake and says it's real, the bigger, <coughs> the bigger the penalty, minus you want it to give, you do want it to give good values, high values to the real data. And therefore, every time it gives high value, you want to, your loss is less you want to go the other direction, plus the penalty factor, which is this. And by now, uh, I trust you guys are feeling that it's all getting very matzy. 
But see, guys, here's the thing. Most of this mathematics is something that, I don't know, I always feel it needs a bit of explaining, otherwise you never get it. And which is what I'm trying to do, that this plus one minus epsilon, uh, G, G, Z. I hope along the way I did not screw up uh, significantly. Two norm minus one, right? And if you are familiar with reg ridge regularization, if you treat this as the W, you realize that this equation, this literally is your W, this is the W vector, then this is your literally your W, W2 norm, right? W norm, W dot W. And this is your ridge, the standard L2 regularization term. It's very interesting that that's what pops out, right? Except that this W is this interesting quantity, is the sensitivity, you're penalizing the sensitivity of the discriminator to changes from, yeah, this. So that's that, that is that. Huh? That is the loss function of the Wasserstein. Yeah. So now you realize, let's go review everything we learned because we did learn quite a bit. And uh, is it, what's the time? Oh, we have only 15 minutes. So definitely time to review in the next five minutes. Uh, guys, is this thing clear? GANs are one of the most influential and dominant neural architectures. It is important to know it once properly. Has those of you who are remote, please give me some feedback. Uh, is it making sense? But Jen, is it making sense? Jen is quiet. Amrit, is it has it so far made sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. No. As you as you mentioned, like if you just look at the math individually, then it's kind of complicated. But if you explain it in terms of like the number line you do and everything, it makes more sense. Yes. So go over this, guys. Uh, go over this. And uh, this is one of the, the textbook that I've given is one of the books that tries to explain it well. And I felt that even that was a little bit fast paced. So I uh, further broke it down into smaller pieces, especially for the Wasserstein GAN, because Wasserstein GANs are very, very uh, respected and considered state of the art. Uh, these days, Wasserstein with the gradient penalty is quite there. And new things, developments continue all the time. And maybe next time when we are giving, we are doing the same course next year, there will be something else that is the state of the art. It just speaks to how rich the field is, right? So guys, this is it. Uh, I'll review everything from the beginning. For the generator, what does the generator need to do? Generator produces from input. You, the input for GANs are trivial. You just pick one from the random noise. That's why it's called a noise goes in. But it's not just typically Gaussian noise goes in. Generator will produce any specific dimension to it, like oh, it's shape. dimension that, that has to be that is implicit. So, guys, when the generator produces GZ, one of the basic things is its shape or vector space size as a vector mm -hmm. must match that of real data. So, for example, if it produces the two dimensional data and the real data is seven dimensional, the discriminator will have a field's day. <laughs> 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 So the dimensionality must match. Generator has to produce things that in every way looks like the real, right? The vector space, the vector space must match. So those things, but those are basic one of like uh, one of one things. Otherwise, you have trouble. Is, is Z is of smaller dimension than G Z, or how do they relate? Uh, See, it is not necessary. Okay. So one way to think of Z is that. Theoretically, at least, if one way to look at it is, you know, in the olden days before there were photographs, or even today, when you go to a police as a witness, you, you sit down with a sketch artist and the, the sketch artist will ask you, so, okay, you saw that criminal, right? That uh, somebody who burglarized a car or whatever, what did he look like? And you said, the guy had long hair. So the person <laughs> notes, the artist notes down. What else do you remember? He said the guy had a beard. Okay, right down. Thin or fat? Oh, he was rather thin. Okay. What kind of eyes? Say, oh, round eyes with, uh, I don't know, blue eyes or something like that, something or the other. What color skin? Something like that. You, you give a few descriptors. What does the sketch artist do? 
the sketch artistics, very little bits of information, blue eyes, brown eyes, hair, bald, or, you know, lots of hair, okay. some very little bits of information. But from that, the, because it is a, a human train generator, uh, yes. it is able to produce a picture of a human being, isn't it? With those characteristics. So that is the nature of Z. Right, with very little, you can think of it as a stick figure. How do you convert a stick figure into an actual photo? Right, that's one way of looking. Right. So that is, and for example, uh, you, you do that. Now, generally what happens is, for GANs actually, you take very little bits of information. You just take it off. And ideally, so for example, with a generator, because you have lots of layers in between, doesn't have to be, Dimensionality of Z need not match the dimensionality of GZ. GZ will be an image, let's say uh, uh, 64 pixels by 64 pixels, right? Whereas yeah. Z has to have a dimensionality that is informative enough. Like it should have enough capacity to explain what is being produced because ultimately Z is being transformed into GZ, right? So you yes. can't take just a number and say, now from this number somehow produce a, um, you know, 64 by 64 image. That's too little info. So even when you give a random number, normalized number, give it a sufficiently high dimensionality, right? Rich enough dimensionality. That is it. It's a hyperparameter. You can just pick, and usually that's not a problem. You you take a sufficiently large dimensionality of Z, give it the very fact that even just taking normal noise, Gaussian noise works good enough for GANs. It speaks to the power of GANs. Yeah. That is incredible. That's absolutely it will do. right. It's uh, yeah. Now, there is one more thing that I want to say. It is considered a min-max problem, and there's a bit of mathematics to it. I don't know if I want to go. Actually, we're out of time. Let's keep it for one of our later, maybe in the lab session. It is called, in, in, in game theory and in certain worlds, you have a problem of min-max, in which one guy is trying to maximize something and one guy is trying to minimize something. So look at it from the discriminator. What is the discriminator trying to do? You want the discriminator, a good loss function in the ideal situation, you want to maximize the ability of the discriminator to tell the real as real, isn't it? And fake as fake. And what do you want the generator to do? Generator to do? You want to generate data such that there is discriminator is hardly able to tell the difference between fake G, 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 Z and Y G Z and the fake, right? The very little gap. Right? It's trying to minimize this loss. That is why this sort of algorithms are min-max algorithms, right? And the name is there, the, the adversarial. Right? You have opposite goals. This is the zero-sum game. Kind of thing, that's why it's like okay. that. Right? But at the end of it, what happens is that, frankly, both get, both, it's not zero. Well, it is, it's played as a zero-sum, sort of opposite game, he's trying to be. Mm. But at the end yeah. of the the cop becomes a super cop and the faker becomes a good faker. Right? Okay. It's a good counterfeiter. And because it becomes a good counterfeiter, you can throw that, for example, you can get rid of the cop and now the counterfeiter will happily produce lots of counterfeits. Like you just saw that. We saw that uh, lots of faces are being produced that don't exist, right? Because the beauty is once you have trained a generator, you have a generator model, it can, it can go on generating infinitely many samples that look real, right? Very close to real. And that is the value of GANs. You train the GANs to produce these. Right. It can produce a whole lot of it. So think of it, guys. GANs are something. Uh, till now, we have done autoencoders and feedforward networks, et cetera. Now we are getting close to things that have profound real-world implications. I would strongly encourage you to, what chapter of the book is it? Uh, chapter, hang on, I have to put on my reading glass for book. Here's my book. It is chapter nine of your book, guys. Huh? Chapter nine of your book. 
please do read chapter nine of the book. At least read the parts that I've taught you. There's a lot, there's congelational gans, et cetera, and we'll cover those at some future date. If you are into, then cover the whole chapter, but at least cover the parts that I covered. Now, and already uh, it is enough for now. But then look around the world and look at the implications of gans, what it can do, and ponder over the ethical implications. What it is, like we say that technology is a tool. It can be used for good or evil. When it comes to GANs, it, is, it sort of comes into focus. When you see with impunity how it can be used for mischief, it's a little frightening. Right? And uh, at this moment, we are in the opposite situation. The generators are doing very well and it's very, very hard to detect fakes, right? Because obviously the people who write the generate, who train the GANs, they will not give you their discrim discriminator, right? Mm. Uh, but they will use a generator to produce fakes. And now it's your job to figure out, is it fake or real? And you don't know. The point is you don't know, it's not labeled data. So how do you detect fakes? How do you detect deep fakes? And that's itself an ongoing area of research. <coughs> All right, guys, so I'll end with that. If you have any questions, I hope you found this interesting. Very. So, yeah, let's see deep learning, right? Now that we have built foundation, every subsequent part, every subsequent session, in my view, you'll find it to be more and more interesting. And we are just laying the foundations. Once we get to application, it just is fun, utter fun. <clears throat> All right, guys. So I'll end with that if you don't have any questions.